Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Now, before I get started, I want to give you a little insider tip. Uh, today, I'm going to be sharing with you my analysis of more than a thousand scientific studies, and I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to be able to see the research for yourself. And trust me, you are going to want to see the research because some of the things that I'm going to say to you today are going to sound so unbelievable. You're going to think to yourself, how can this possibly be true? And you will want to see proof. So all you have to do is remember four words. These four words, show me the science, like show me the money. And if you can remember that, you can go to showmethescience.com. And I've actually pulled out 100 of the studies, put them online. They're full articles. You can read them. You can dig in and get geeky if you want. And I happen to know you'll remember these four words better if you say them out loud. So on the count of three, I want you to all shout back at me, show me the science, OK? One, two, three. Show me the science. OK, you guys are ready. Now let's, let's do this. OK. So uh, I'm a gamer. And what that means about me is that I like to have goals. So I like to have this kind of secret missions and special objectives. And I have a special mission for this talk. And by the way, Cheryl and Ernie are going to look like geniuses for putting the first three speakers together because this crazy through line is emerging in our talks. That's because my secret mission for this talk is that I'm going to try to increase the lifespan of everyone in this room by seven and a half minutes. Apparently, 72 seconds of that I can't take credit for, but <laughs> I will increase it by seven and a half minutes. You will live seven and a half minutes longer than you would have otherwise just because you watched this talk. Now, I see despite the previous talk, some of you are still looking a little bit skeptical. That's OK, because I have math to prove that it's possible. <laughs> This is the math. It won't make a lot of sense now. I promise I will explain it all later. For now, just note that little number at the bottom, plus 7.682458.37 minutes. That will be my gift to you if I am successful. Now, you have a secret mission, too. This is your secret mission. You have to figure out how you want to spend these seven and a half bonus minutes today. And I want you to do something unusual with them, because these are bonus minutes. And you weren't going to have them anyway, so I don't want you to spend them sending text messages or anything like that. Think of something creative. Now, knowing that I'm a game designer, you might have an idea of what I would tell you to do with these minutes. You might be thinking to yourself, she's going to tell us to spend them playing games. Now, this is a totally reasonable assumption. I have made quite a habit of encouraging people to spend more time playing games. Um, in a TED talk I gave, I kind of famously proclaimed that we should spend 21 billion hours a week playing games. We're only up to 7 billion hours a week now, to kind of put that in perspective. And 21 billion hours is a lot of time, admittedly. Um, it's so much time, in fact, that in the past few years, the number one unsolicited comment that I have heard from strangers all over the world every single day is this. Jane, games are great and all, but on your deathbed, are you really going to wish you spent more time playing Angry Birds? I hear this all the time. This idea is so pervasive that games are a waste of time that we will later regret. Now, I, I want to take this question seriously. I mean, just to give you an example, this guy, uh, this cab driver, earlier this year, I was on my way to a conference in Austin. And uh, the driver's like, oh, what are you here for? I'm here to give a talk about games. He stops the cab. He turns around and says to me, and I quote, I hate games, waste of life. Imagine getting to the end of your life and regretting all that time. So he literally said that. I was so stunned because I was just about to tell people that I hear this all the time that I took a picture of him to prove that it actually happened, which is why I have a photo of my cab driver. OK, so, so let's take this question seriously because it's on everyone's minds. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. When we are on our deathbeds, will we regret all these hours that we spent playing games? Now, this may surprise you, but it turns out there is actually some research on this question. Hospice workers, the people who take care of us at the end of our lives, recently issued a report on the most frequently expressed regrets that people have when they are literally on their deathbeds. And that's actually what I want to share with you this morning, the top five regrets of the dying. Number one, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number two, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Number three, 
I wish I'd let myself be happier. Number four, I wish I'd had the courage to express my true self. And number five, I wish I'd lived a life true to my dreams instead of what others expected of me. Okay, now as far as I know, no one told the hospice workers I wish I'd spent more time playing games, fair enough. But when I hear these top five regrets, I can't help but hear five deep human cravings that games can actually help us fulfill. For example, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. For many people, that means I wish I'd spent more time with my family, with my kids when they were growing up. But we know from research at Brigham Young University School of Family Life that playing games together as a family has tremendous benefits. The research shows that parents who spend more time playing video games with their kids have much stronger real life relationships with them. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Okay, well hundreds of millions of people every day use social network games to stay in touch with real life friends and family. We know from recent research at Michigan State University that these games have the ability to serve as powerful relationship management tools. Now what that means is that these games help us stay actively in touch with people in our extended social network that we would otherwise grow distant from or lose touch with if we weren't playing games together. I wish I'd let myself be happier. Now here I can't help but think of the groundbreaking clinical trials that have recently been conducted at East Carolina University documenting that online casual games outperform pharmaceuticals for treating clinical anxiety and depression. So this is true. 30 minutes of online gaming a day led to significant changes in mood, positive changes, and increased happiness. I wish I'd had the courage to express my true self. <laughs> right, avatars, of course, are a way to express our true selves, maybe our most heroic or idealized version of who we could become. This is a portrait of a gamer and his avatar from a series called Alter Ego, a beautiful portrait series. And one thing that I'm really interested in is research that's been happening at Stanford University for years now, documenting how playing a game with an idealized avatar changes how we think and act in real life, specifically making us more confident, more ambitious, and more committed to our real life goals. I wish I'd led a life true to my dreams and not what others expected of me. Okay, this one I left a question mark, a Super Mario question mark, because I'm not sure games are doing this yet. We usually think of games as being escapist, sort of ignoring our real lives, not helping us pursue a real life dream. So I'm not sure where the research is on this yet. We'll come back to it. Now maybe by now you've started to wonder, why is a game designer talking to us about deathbed regrets. I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, I have not been on my deathbed yet, and I haven't volunteered in a hospice. But uh, recently, I did have the opportunity to spend three months in bed wanting to die, uh, actually really wanting to die. And I'd like to tell you that story. So it started when I hit my head in a routine household accident. I got a concussion, but the concussion didn't heal properly. And after 30 days, I was left still concussed. I had nonstop symptoms like headaches, nausea, vertigo, mental fog, memory loss. And my doctor told me at the time that the number one thing that I could do to heal my brain was to rest it. So I had to avoid things that triggered my symptoms. Now for me, that meant no reading, no writing, no video games, no work or email, no running, no alcohol, no caffeine. In other words, and I think you know where this is going, no reason to live. <laughs> um, which, of course, is meant to be a joke, but in all seriousness, suicidal ideation is extremely common with traumatic brain injuries. It happens to one in three, and it happened to me. My brain started telling me, Jane, you want to die. It said, you're never gonna get better. It said, the pain will never end. And these voices became so persistent and so persuasive that I, I legitimately feared for my life.